Yeah. 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 Okay. Now you have You're it. seeing some mountains. Ah, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. I apologize for the uh, delay, but uh, we've been using Zoom. I'm very new to the Microsoft Teams. But Teams. Uh, so, Ravi, is it okay if we record your presentation? Sure, yeah. Yeah, no problem. So, let, let, let's just give it a, a minute or so. Um, people are still trickling in as usual. Sure, yeah. I, I'll wait and prompt me when we're ready. Um, but anyway, um, going back to going back to <clears throat> what Sundar was, Sundar was mentioning about how is uh, do you have friends in Ukraine and lot of friends, Ravi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both I mean, sides. So. yeah, both sides. Yeah. <clears throat> I still remember your uh, some of your papers <laughs> when I read it. It says Kiev. I mean, <clears throat> uh, it's called Institute for Problems of Strength, something like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's some very nice work there uh, on mechanics. Mm -hmm. They have a journal no? a published called Problems of Strength. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I do. Um, I do look at them many times. I think um, more so, uh, more so when I was in Right Path, uh, they had all those English translations of Russian journals. Yeah, they still do. Yeah, I, I think uh, maybe we should get started. Uh, So, uh, Ravi, let me just quickly introduce you, and then you can you can begin. Sure, thank uh, you. Can Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So, yeah. Uh, well, welcome everybody to this uh, seminar. Uh, one more in the seminar series uh, from the Indian Structural Integrity Society. We're very pleased today to have uh, Professor Ravi Chandran, who's uh, uh, one of the many Ravi Chandrans in fracture mechanics. <laughs> uh, he's the one in Utah. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about him. He's uh, an alumnus of the Indian Institute of Science, where he completed his master's and PhD, and he joined Utah after some time at the Air Force Research Laboratories at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Uh, his interests cover a, a wide variety of, of things, both materials and testing methods uh, in, the, in the broad area of mechanical behavior, including titanium alloys, steels, and, and biomaterials. Uh, he's been the director of the Utah State Center of Excellence for Advanced Titanium Materials uh, about a decade ago. Uh, he's been honored by TMS with the uh, 2006 Champion Matthewson Award and also the Fellowship of the American Society for Metals. He's an outstanding teacher. He's received this award three times uh, from the University of Utah and has authored over 160 publications. So, Ravi, we're very much looking forward to your presentation on a very important topic and which has been around for a while and never seems to stop being out of fashion, and that is size effects in fracture. Ravi, all yours. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Vikram, and uh, thank you, Sundar, um, and thank you, Raghu, for uh, uh, for inviting me to provide this presentation. Uh, I heard about Indian Structural Inter Integrity Society, and it's a great idea. I think Sundar mentioned to me one, one of these WebEx meetings and fitting and fracture uh, organized by Kujawski here. Uh, but it's great to see uh, a pool of some great people working in metallurgy, material science, and fracture mechanics and mechanics, aeronautics, uh, you know, um, kind of create a club together and form this organization uh, and uh, for a, as, a, as a way of collective, collectively identifying the contributions from India. Um, and of course, India is growing a lot and I see a lot of uh, things happening in India. I'm very proud of as an as a uh, as an, you know, um, Indian American. Uh, 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 as uh, Vikram uh, indicated that uh, size effect and fraction mechanics is, is a subject that uh, never went out of fashion, but also never has been resolved yet. Um, I we just turned to the uh, uh, turn 
to the attention of size effect in between and fracture. Uh, for many years, my work has been uh, mostly metallurgy oriented work on fatigue and fracture mechanics, but rarely I looked deep into the size effect or the mechanics of fracture. But when you start um, looking at uh, different test results uh, and uh, different specimen geometries, uh, one begin to see a significant size effect, uh, whether it is fatigue crack growth or it is uh, fracture toughness and so on. So I, in this presentation, I have two parts. Um, um, uh, 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 can you all see my slides fine? Yes, yes, yeah, we can see. Yeah. Please go ahead. OK, thank you. Uh, so uh, traditionally, we have known uh, that there is a size effect in terms of thickness effect. Like um, you all, I'm sure you all heard about plane strain uh, fracture toughness. So there is a minimum thickness, something like an one inch in a CT specimen is required. Um, a thickness of one inch and above where you can expect to get a uh, you know um, thickness independent fracture toughness. Uh, and then uh, in below that size, typically about one inch, um, then uh, the toughness actually goes up. And that's a con that's considered to be the plane stress effect, a transition from plane strain to plane stress. But uh, there's, there's a size effect beyond that. Uh, so in fact, it, so the stickless effect is one of the broader uh, effects of size on fracture. Um, and currently in fracture mechanics, there is, uh, there's no clear way to deal with it uh, because um, you see some of these um, uh, stress intensity factor solutions, uh, they all have been um, uh, numerically developed for CCT specimen, for example, uh, height to width ratio about three, two to three, and, and there's no variable in that expression to change your size and determine K if you're doing a fracture toughness test or you're doing a fatigue crack growth test. So, um, so this subject has not, has not been really uh, explored in deep. Uh, so in a way, uh, the size effect is assumed to not exist, um, at least in metals that as far as I have seen in literature. But on the other hand, there is if you if you go and look at the literature as well as look at some of the results, one begins to see the size effect historically as well as in some recent results. Um, that's what I'm going to kind of go over in this presentation in two parts. First part is the historical review, and then the second part uh, is uh, what is the mechanics, what are the ways we can try to rationalize the size effect or explore the size effect that you see in fracture toughness or in fatigue crack growth. Uh, and there is, as a side note, uh, Raghu probably knows very well that uh, he's, in fact, he's working on it. I guess uh, there is a size effect in concrete as popularized by Bazant at Northwestern University, but that's of a different kind. So I'm not going to discuss about that here, but uh, it turns out the mechanics that we are going to discuss here is also relevant there, but that's a story for another time. Uh, the earliest investigation of size effect goes back to uh, Da Vinci. So he was, you know, so more, more, most of you know very well, you know, uh, Da Vinci was like an all-rounder, a painter, scientist, philosopher, inventor, uh, and all kinds of stuff. So in, in 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 the West or even all over the world, he's looked upon one of the greatest scientific minds that that triggered many revolutions in science and society uh, many many years ago in Europe. And and he was uh, reportedly uh, he was uh, experimenting with strength of wires, and he found when he changes the length of the wire, that um, strength goes down. So there is a size effect, a length effect on strength of the wire, which is now thought, <clears throat> which is now explained through Weibull uh, statistical approach, because. Um, on the basis that if you increase the wire, the, uh, the increased length is likely to contain a, a damaging flaw, thereby uh, increased likelihood of finding a lower strength in a longer length wire. Uh, so, but that's that, that that's what the empirical, even variable statistics is an empirical way of expressing variability in strength with size. In this case, for example, uh, the length of the wire, <clears throat> but there's no, there no physics, uh, there's no mechanics. Uh, that why uh, why should uh, a, a long wire uh, should be weaker than a short wire? 
Um, and this is true. Even if we control the flow, flow size, that, that brings us to fracture mechanics. Suppose I bring a, um, uh, samples of different lengths, con other dimensions being constant, I introduce a notch of same size in all different sizes. One would, <clears throat> one would find that a longer specimen has a lower strength at a constant flow size. Uh, uh, there's not many data out there to support it, but I have seen some data and I'm going to share you share with you a little bit later. Uh, <clears throat> one of the earliest indications of size effect was uh, was as um, as written by George Irwin in 1997 article in JOAM, which Journal of Metals, the more metallurgy journal, and uh, he points to the uh, earliest study by Stanton and Batson, and also Docherty. This is like 19, uh, Standard and Batson did the impact toughness tests on steel, like a Charpy impact testing of steel with the V notch. And then, you know, he varied sample sizes um, and then determined toughness, and he showed a strong size effect. Subsequently, Docherty also, I think in, in some uh, British arsenal, I think, somewhere in, uh, uh, somewhere in North England, somewhere in Scotland. Uh, he was uh, experimenting uh, slow bending tests of notch samples. Uh, and these samples were um, mechanically similar, meaning uh, there is a mechanical similitude by varying uh, specimens in, in, in proportionate sizes when you do the test. So uh, it's, it's amazing how Stanton and Batson as well as Docherty was very careful in keeping mechanical similitude, that means when you increase the um, length, increase the width or thickness in proportion. So the so the ratios are the same when you go from small to large specimen, and and you'll see that here. So this is some of the uh, uh, slow bending test results of Docherty, and the photograph on top shows you know three different sizes of samples. And this is a bending test, and depth is the or the width of the beam is shown. Uh, so he basically varied the uh, depth of the specimen. And, uh, and if you look at his uh, load displacement records in the figure um, bottom left, um, basically he tried to plot um, a load divided by uh, area of the section, uh, uh, or actually the uh, yeah, load divided by area of the section, and uh, and you can see these curves, uh, and you can see the ones that are appear to be kind of brutal uh, goes up to some the first curve on the left. There's a maximum load and then drops, uh, so almost like a semi brutal b behavior. Uh, that's the uh, uh, that is the one of the biggest samples, uh, but if you go to small size, something like ten millimeter. Um, by 2.5 millimeter, the curve on the farthest right uh, it has a more ductile behavior. There's a maximum, uh, the, 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 the peak is kind of an approximate measurement of stress that the specimen is being subjected to during bending. And you can see the peak stress is roughly the same, but the area under the curve is actually much, much higher in a smaller specimen. Uh, so meaning that when you plot the uh, energy of fracture, uh, which is shown in the, which this is a figure that copied from Docherty's paper. Uh, on the right, you see the energy uh, per unit volume, um, basically uh, um, uh, foot, you know, um, foot pounds, which is basically the energy in, in English units, divided by centimeter cubes. So he's kind of mixing units, but essentially energy is the uh, specific strain energy. Uh, in bending, uh, that's the x-axis in the figure on the right, uh, and uh, there's a y-axis, I'm sorry, uh, x-axis is your depth of the specimen or the width of the specimen. So as you can see in small specimen, when the uh, depth of the specimen is small, has a much higher uh, uh, specific fracture energy, and then it goes down um, uh, when you increase the depth of the specimen. The data is not plenty, but there is uh, there is sufficient data to support that the um, inverse uh, relationship between specimen depth uh, and fraction energy. Uh, uh, be, even before Docherty's experiments, 
uh, Stanton and Batson compiled uh, impact test experiments of a large number of uh, steels. Uh, in fact, his paper uh, published in 1900, it's hard to get, but it, it's, it, it runs up something like 50 pages and one of the most extensive compilations of impact fraction energies as a function of size. And what is interesting in Stanton's work was uh, he, he will, uh, to make make sure the similitude of specimen, in addition to the mechanical similitude of specimen, that is specimen dimensions are proportionately increased from small to high larger sizes. He also uh, employed fixtures and loading frames that are also proportionately sized. So it's incredible. Uh, so basically, there was a mechanical similitude in specimen dimensions, and also the testing similitude in terms of a, uh, <clears throat> in terms of the anvil uh, for the impact testing, as well as the pendulums used to strike the samples to measure the impact energy. So he he also showed, I mean, in fact, more thoroughly than Doherty that um, when you increase the depth of the beam, that means when you go to bigger and bigger sizes, uh, the sample dimensions being in proportion. Um, uh, the impact fraction energy or the specific fraction energy um, goes down exponentially. Now here, uh, there's no calculation. You can simply measure the energy from the pendulum, uh, as the, the residual swing of the pendulum um, uh, uh, gives you a measure of uh, how much energy is absorbed. Uh, from the dial indicator, as most of you know. So this is not calculated, just actually the measured values for different depths of the beam. So there is a strong size effect. Uh, some of the Irvine's works also indicates that there's a size effect in, uh, uh, in uh, I believe, in notch tension testing. So the results uh, shown on the right is basically fracture work per unit volume, similar measure that we talked about in the previous two slides with specimen um, width. Uh, and these samples are notched, and now we can see the um, general trend. These are the log-log plots. The y-axis now it's log, so you tend to get a straight line for an exponential decrease in fra fraction energy with increase in specimen uh, breadth or width. <coughs> Excuse me. So somewhat similar to the uh, work of uh, Docherty uh, and um, and Stanton and Batson, uh, and he even did indicate uh, the reason for this size effect is potentially related to the fact that the work of fracture, um, uh, you know, um, is uh, is is uh, the work of fracture is sort of dependent on how it's dissipated in the specimen volume. Um, I think um, I think the previous slide he mentioned that somewhere. Okay, I'll I'll come back to that later. Here he refers to um, he refers to the fact that before fracture strain energy is stored in the volume, during fracture it is dissipated in a planar area. So there is a disconnect between what is the energy stored in the specimen in a volume versus how it is dissipated largely in a planar fashion, like uh, when the crack is trying to propagate and fracture through the depth of the specimen. So we'll, we'll put that aside for a moment now and then come back to uh, an idea that how we can explain potentially a size effect coming from a totally different world. This is a testing of a polymer form um, and on the left, you see uh, a test with a notch, um, a photoelastic image of a specimen that is gripped and pulled in tension. And you see this white contours, and, and I indicated as a boundary of unloaded region. So when you pull the specimen with the notch uh, and the regions above the notch, almost the entire length of the specimen is kind of unloaded. That's why you see them in like a bright, um, a bright region and the rest of the region uh, to the left of the crack is kind of dark. Uh, I hope you see the specimen uh, edge, far edge, somewhat dark here, but I hope you can see it. So the notch is about point A by W point two. So the uh, rest of the ligament about point eight A by W is kind of dark, meaning the stress is uh, entirely bound by that region, whereas the regions above and below the crack sort of um, unloaded, 
uh, there's no loading. And that makes sense from a strength of materials point of view. So in most of the discussions here, we uh, we talk about this unloaded region and loaded region in the sense of um, uh, Timoshenko, right? So you probably remember Timoshenko's approach to strength of materials, where we we we, we talk about in averages like average stress and average strength, um, average strain. So in, in that sense, I mean those kind of approaches have, uh, in fact, they are actually practically used that way, quite accurate, even though they may not necessarily agree with the exact elasticity solutions. Uh, 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 like here in fraction mechanics, we talk about stress singularity um, uh, from William's stress function or Westergaard's stress function. Uh, so we we set aside that for a moment and look at the gross uh, unloaded area and gross loaded area in a notch specimen. And the, this experiment seems to support that idea that when you load a notch specimen, pretty much the entire region of the uh, uh, specimen above and below the crack uh, from the from the crack to the end of the specimen is approximately unloaded. Uh, so um, if you don't have the grip at the edge, the, the reason the contours kind of curve off and meet the edge uh, is because the grips prevent the Poisson contraction when you load it. So there is a there's a restraint at the edges that prevents from uh, that that unloaded region being straight, like a, a, a rectangular vertical bar, and this is somewhat like an ellipse, elongated ellipse, uh, with the <clears throat> with the cracks centered along the minor axis. Uh, anyway, uh, so Mart's experiment uh, involved testing strength of polymer forms with such cracks of different lengths. So. I'll come back to this in a moment. Um, uh, and if you look at some of the results, the fraction energy uh, for various crack sizes is shown in the left uh, figure um, in the slide. Uh, so when you, um, uh, uh, when he increased the length of the polyethylene specimen, the, 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 the film was polyethylene film uh, of about millimeter in thickness, I think. So when he increased the length of these polyethylene specimens, uh, the fraction energy is again experimentally measured, not calculated. So he has a he has a uh, he has improvised a way of measuring uh, energy of fracture of a polymer form uh, by recording the load and uh, displacement during the experiment. So these energies are uh, experimentally measured. Um, so when he increase the so the figure shows that for different crack sizes, if you increase the crack size at a given length fraction energy goes down. I mean, that's explainable uh, by fraction mechanics. But if you increase for a given crack size, if you look at the increased length, uh, he went from a length of 30 millimeters to about 180 millimeters, so about a six-fold increase in fraction energy. Um, and you can see the fraction energy is higher for a, for a um, given crack size. And, and this increase is actually true for all crack sizes. Um, so the only way you can rationalize this, this data is by plotting uh, things as uh, specific fraction energies. Basically, take the each each data divided by the specimen volume, and when you do that, so basically you're dividing by the actual length uh, of each sample, all other dimensions being constant. So this varying value when you divide the data on the left by the appropriate length of the specimen from which the data was obtained. You see all the data consolidate. So, which is so basically, we are looking at strain energy per unit volume independent of size. Um, now, how we can rationalize this uh, in two ways. One is we can try to put uh, a, make a plot uh, the shown on the right with the dotted line, uh, which is from the uh, Griffiths uh, uh, strain energy increase in a solid in an infinite specimen, uh, which is which is the uh, uh, right side of the slide. Uh, basically, so when, when you introduce a crack, um, uh, according to Griffith's idea, uh, at fixed displacement, uh, uh, sorry, uh, at fixed stresses at infinity, if you increase the, incre if you introduce a crack in an infinite solid with the stress at infinity being fixed, you're actually doing the work. Um, uh, because the displacements of the, uh, the specimen exteriors of the infinity will increase. So that corresponds to the, uh, by 
um, Clipperon's theorem. Uh, so whenever you do external work at the infinite boundary, that should correspond to an increase in strain energy in your specimen. So that is the quantity Griffith actually computed using um, using uh, English uh, equations for stress distribution uh, in a notched plate. Uh, and he it was complex mathematics and curvilinear coordinates. He was able to determine the increase in energy. Uh, and if you say that increase in energy is what that causes that fracture in each sample, uh, you can determine, um, you can kind of equate the increased strain energy in that uh, in that specimen uh, to the fracture, fracture work, which is uh, shown as tau in the red symbol here, uh, capital tau here. So if you equate that, you find an expression uh, for a, a constant uh, fracture, a specific fracture energy of the material, which is the material property, uh, then the uh, experimental strain energy, um, specific strain energy at specimen fracture should inversely go as um, uh, square of the crack size uh, shown in the bottom on the right. So that is the plot uh, shown in the figure in dash line. The other plot I have is the a quantity we call change in net section strain energy. Uh, I'll show you how we compute it in a moment, but it's it's looking at similar to uh, looking at this Mott's experimental result. If we think about before uh, we introduce a crack, th think about a specimen that loaded to at some load and keep the load constant. Now we introduce a crack. Um, just like Griffith has imagined, the the specimen compliance is more, so the loading points will move. So that is specimen is doing the work, right? So that that work is actually equal to the increase in strain energy because uh, because of this reciprocal principle by Clapeyron's theorem, whatever external work is done at the boundary should equal to the strain energy increase in the solid. It's a basic mechanics fact. So. In that, uh, in the same way, um, you can actually calculate what is the increase in strain energy in the net section when there is a crack. So when fracture occurs, we, we hypothesize that this increase in strain energy due to a crack in the net section is that which contributes to fracture because whatever um, strain energy that was there before in the ligament was basically unloaded after fracture. Energies, strain energy is lost from the uh, uh, regions of the material above and below the fracture plane. So that is spent. So if you remove that quantity, so whatever that increases, whatever the inc energy increase that happened due to the notch before fracture is that which is responsible for fracture, uh, uh, fracture uh, of the specimen. So maybe a little bit, uh, abstract right now, but I will explain how we compute that a little bit later. So if you could, if we consider that's why it is responsible for fracture, one gets a quantity that I show uh, in the bottom. Uh, specific strain energy at specimen fracture would be again tau times uh, a, a factor one minus a by w by a by w, which is basically um, the ligament. Uh, so the, the above the numerator is the um, fractional ligament that is intact that was intact before fracture and the quantity below the um, uh, the denominator is a normalized crack size so essentially it's it's a ratio of ligament size to the crack size in a normalized sense so that is the quantity that we use to plot the blue curve here uh, on the right that seems to agree with um, uh, about half of the data uh, with crack sizes about uh, point, point 0.5. And, and what happens at crack size below 0.5? Now, uh, we should remember that this is a polyethylene specimen and they don't have a clean crack, especially when you go to, when, when you attempt to create a short crack, there is a significant amount of uh, crazing at the crack, tip, uh, leading to a poor definition of what the crack size is. Uh, just like a, so the crack is not a sharp crack, like a brittle crack, it's more like a Dugdale type crack where there's a zone of craze uh, akin to the um, ideally plastic, uh, you know, a strip plastic uh, zone uh, as imagined in Dugdale theory. 
So, so if we account for that, potentially uh, those data points will actually move to the right. So the effective crack length is actually longer than uh, the short cracks uh, for sizes below 0.5. So uh, uh, we have not showed that, uh, but I'm assuming that could potentially move the data points to the right. A similar story for impact experiment. Uh, the, in, in the case here, the uh, fraction energy normalized by specimen length, uh, in which case, uh, which is the, da the raw data is on the left, and the fraction energy normalized by the uh, specimen dimensions is on the right y-axis, and x-axis is your crack size. So the data again, all the experiment data consolidate. The, the experiment seem to agree uh, better with the net section change in strain energy concept. Um, but again, there is a discrepancy at small sizes, possibly due to the poor definition of a crack size due to crack tip crazing. We'll revisit this a little bit later, but this is some little bit of a, a, a kind of a preliminary about what we think of a size effect and whether there's any experimental effect, experimental data to support it. Uh, I, I believe this is sort of partially supporting our idea of uh, how the length of the specimen is important uh, in determining the specific fraction energy. Uh, the more recent results are in, in metals. Uh, this is some data from Robert Ritchie's group. Um, and he, and, and, and uh, many students in Robert Ritchie's group would look at fracture toughness of metallic glass, which is basically brittle. Uh, and if you look at some of the data, uh, just like um, just like uh, Docherty's result, the fracture toughness in bending tests, three point bending tests of brittle specimens, um, you know, decrease when you increase the ligament size or the net section size. Uh, and uh, uh, the th these works have not provided a, a clear explanation uh, mechanically, or a, a, there's no clear mechanics explanation. Uh, to explain away why fracture toughness should decrease when the ligament size is uh, increasing. Uh, just like uh, Stanton's, uh, uh, Stanton and Batson and Docherty's results. So this is a uh, uh, relatively more recent, I think 2016 result showing the size effect on fracture toughness in metallic glass specimens. Uh, now, uh, uh, Richie and his group tried to rationalize that uh, the, these specimens are probably below the fracture toughness size limit as specified in ASTM E399. That means, uh, so they were trying to interpret this potentially due to plasticity, um, specimen being too small to contain the plasticity close to the crack tip uh, to, the, uh, to make sure the uh, uh, LEFM is valid. So, uh, you know, the, we all know that happens only when you have a thick specimen, a large enough specimen, the plane strain conditions are valid. So that is the spirit of ASTM E399 a recommendation that you should have a minimum ligament size as shown on the right, that um, uh, when you meet the requirement for any sizes above that size, the fracture toughness is independent uh, of uh, ligament size as shown on the right. But for smaller sizes, then you have a, a specimen behaving relatively more ductile, just like a plain stress case. Um, and there the plasticity spreads further into the knit section. So you're basically violating the linear elastic fraction mechanics assumptions. And so one, one can expect a size effect. So this is the idea that has been uh, around, uh, popularized by Richie and other people uh, working uh, with him. So we're gonna talk about, so these, these things are out there. Uh, and these are we, we find these these are not adequate in explaining away um, the HTM fraction mechanics, plane stress, plane strain ideas, uh, how they change with thickness are not sufficient to explain the size effect that we are seeing. Example showed in the uh, in a polyethylene experiment, as well as uh, the historic results by Stanton and Batson and Docherty, they are not explainable uh, on the basis of this ASTM interpretation of plane stress and plane strain transition uh, when you make bigger samples. Uh, we'll revisit that a little bit. We'll switch to fatigue crack growth. And there is also some um, mixed bag of results, uh, some data showing there's no effect of uh, specimen size. In this case, specimen width 
of a central crack tension specimen. This is some of the data done in NASA in the 1970s or 60s, perhaps, by Hudson. And he, pr he pretty much, I mean, he showed, you know, he tested plates of different width, varying from about two inch wide to 20 inch wide, and showed there's no effect of width. Uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, a more recent result on bending, uh, again, geometrically similar specimens, uh, fatigue rack growth experiments show that in a, uh, in a bigger specimen, uh, the D being the depth of the specimen shown on the left, and the data from three different uh, specimens of three different depth values are shown on the right. So you can see when the uh, for a depth of 40 millimeters, the crack growth rate is uh, significantly higher than the one with the depth of 10 millimeter. Um, so showing you some size effect. The size effect is you know, remember the data is plotted uh, in log scale in the left uh, uh, y-axis. So you have you have a difference of about at least two or three orders of magnitude between the largest size uh, showing faster crack growth compared to the smaller size, uh, which is at the bottom data. Um, <clears throat> uh, similar results were, were seen in compact tension specimen elastic plastic crack growth uh, by Dowling. Uh, in experiments done in 1970s. Um, if you plot the crack growth data, uh, he took specimens as wide as CT specimens as wide as 16 inch uh, uh, as being the largest size he tested and about one to two inch wide samples, the smallest CT specimen he tested. He did show that, <clears throat> that um, kind of a different result. Uh, you have uh, wider specimens having a better crack growth resistance, a slower crack growth rate for a given delta K compared to uh, a smaller specimen. So somewhat contrast um, to what was seen in three pine bending in epoxy. Anyway, so th these are not explainable in the current framework of fraction mechanics. Similarly, um, Gard and Resco uh, showed effect of width on fatigue crack growth. Um, the top two figures are in terms of delta K for different width samples, like 1W1 through 5W1. And you can see uh, this is in agreement with Dowling's work. So wider specimen, CT specimens again, uh, are, you know, the data on the right shows for the widest specimen tested. Um, I think the five width is about 50 millimeter. Uh, five width sample being 50 millimeter. Uh, I'm sorry, 125 millimeters as shown in the table. And then the one wide uh, sample being one inch. So there's a factor of five uh, difference in width. Uh, so the wider sample showing a, a more crack growth resistance, the DADN curve shifted to the right relative to one inch wide sample in the figures um, in the figure uh, and top left for a stress ratio of 0.1. And, and even if you plot in terms of the same figure, if you look at the same, uh, the figure just below uh, the bottom left figure, the same data is plotted in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, delta K effective after subtracting crack closure. And you can see the result now flip, the wider samples showing uh, faster crack growth rate related to a smaller sample. Again, uh, these results have not been explained uh, thoroughly. There is some effect of crack closure, but a full account of what the size effect is on fatigue crack growth is not done yet. I'm going to skip these two slides. We'll revisit this. Um, I'm going to come to uh, come to a set of experiments that we have done. Um, actually, um, it was done in the um, uh, in Colorado uh, by Sarah. Um, she tested, uh, basically these are fatigue crack growth experiments on single edge notch sample. Uh, uh, these are rotationally constrained samples as shown um, on the left. Uh, and basically you, you do, you vary the length of the specimen. Specimen have a constant width, but varying lengths giving you H by W values 
anywhere between 0.42 to about three. So there's a factor of six, about six increase in length of the specimen, everything being constant, width and thickness. And this is basically aluminum alloy, 7075 T6 aluminum alloy, particular growth testing at R.1, uh, are pretty are point, are, are equal to 0.05, and crack lens was measured by a DC potential drop technique. So this is a raw, raw data which you see on the right, um, crack length, changes in crack length with cycles, and typical of a fatigue growth experiment. Uh, and now you take these data, calculate DAD and delta K curves, right? So uh, how do we do this? Uh, you have the crack length versus number of cycles data, and you have the stress, and you know the specimen is single edge notch sample, uh, as actually called um, modified single edge tension sample. That is why it's called MSE within parenthesis T. So basically that refers to sample that is rotationally constrained at the edges when testing as opposed to a pin loaded sample uh, because of the expression in uh, in the handbook, fraction mechanics handbook by Tata, Paris and Irwin refers to a, a condition where pin loaded sample, so the K solutions are the F of A by W finite width correction factors provided there were uh, where for um, uh, provided there was for uh, pin loaded geometry, uniform stress pin loaded, which means uh, the specimens to use those expressions, one should employ specimens that get, that rotate at, at pins when you do the test. This is not the case here. So, um, uh, so, so you see then if you use the incorrect uh, expression uh, due to, I mean, uh, intended for a pin loading, uh, and we, if you use it here to compute the DAD and delta K data, and you see the data doesn't agree uh, as shown on the left. So what you see on the left is the uh, crack growth data uh, plotted as a function of delta K calculated using the pin loaded or uniform stress finite width correction factor or geometry correction factor as often that's referred to. Uh, so, uh, you know, you see the longer specimens with higher H by W of three, which is a red points uh, are, are above are uh, having faster crack growth rates compared to a shorter specimen, uh, which is the shortest one we have here, is uh, H by W point four. Uh, so uh, now these are, you see, this difference exists over the entire range of delta K. So it's not possible for us to interpret this as due to crack closure or plane stress, plane strain transition, uh, or any of that stuff that we are we normally use in fraction mechanics. Uh, and you also notice the shift that you see are the apparent disagreement between a crack growth data of different of specimens of different length. The shift you see is uniform through the entire delta K region or the entire range of crack growth data. Okay, so then we thought, okay, perhaps we are not using the right K expression. And we so we looked at some of the um, handbooks and there is another expression that says more applicable to this rotationally constrained uh, MSET sample modified single edge tension specimen is that doesn't rotate at the ends when you test. So that using that expression um, that brought the data closer, but still not not a good agreement. There is still variability due to the size. Uh, so um, in order to examine uh, why this occurs is we thought of this net section concept, which I talked to you about. Now uh, I have the opportunity to explain fully what we mean by that. Uh, so I'll take a moment to just quickly review that idea of what is the change in net section strain energy uh, in a notch specimen, how, how that works during um, crack growth. If you assume R equal to zero, like a R zero test roughly, so constant, constant amplitude testing, um, you know, delta K increases with the uh, uh, crack length in a constant amplitude testing. In the same sense, if you imagine the cyclic strain energy in the niche section also increases with crack length. Uh, and and what is that and how do we determine that? So here is what we explain uh, how we do that. So if you look at the uh, loading of a schematic of the sp loaded specimen, uh, you see a specimen of length H and width gripped 
uh, you know, rotation, no rotation uh, gripping at the ends. So there is a part of specimen inside the grips that is clamped. So we often call it clamped edge, right? Um, samples um, or clamped edge testing. And so if you if you don't have a crack, the specimen will show an elastic deflection of delta naught. Now, under the same load, if you introduce a crack, uh, let's say halfway through the sample, then due to increase compliance, the specimen will deflect more. So now there's a change in the strain energy of the sample. Uh, and on average, it is concentrated in the next section, so shown in green. And how do we compute that? Uh, we, we compute this by comparing the load displacement, um, the, the simple principle, like uh, as illustrated in fracture mechanics books, that the energy difference is the area between the two curves as shown on the right. So if you if you if you if you have a uh, the one uh, crack free specimen has a low display uh, low displacement relationship as shown in the uh, figure on top uh, right side on top and then when there is a crack is introduced that curve should have a lower slope right uh, with, so with the crack size so the um, so the uh, at constant load there are two different deflections before crack is introduced and after crack is introduced, right? So that gives you that area, um, uh, area highlighted as uh, highlighted in pink color here. So that is your work done. In an, in in essence, uh, that is external work done when the crack is introduced. Uh, and but you can interpret this in terms of stress as well. Uh, so you convert the stress uh, uh, stress in the ligament before the crack arrived there is sigma. After you introduce the crack, that stress has increased. So there's increase in stress in the next section after the crack arrived there. And that increase in stress also causes increase in elastic strain energy, which corresponds to the work done uh, as interpreted in the figure above. So this is what we call the change in um, strain energy uh, of the net section, and you can up, you can kind of slightly modify uh, for various uh, stress ratio. If you change the stress ratio from R equal to zero to 0 0.5 or 0 0.7, you can account for that. That is shown in a different paper, uh, but I won't go through here. We just simply talk about R R close to zero. That means we have to worry about only P max. Uh, P minimum is zero uh, practically. So for that case, if you compute this quantity, you get an equation uh, as shown on the right. Um, you notice that the equation on the top I have includes stress ratio R, and uh, that is from that from that work I mentioned about where we accounted for the stress ratio effect to compute the change in strain energy in the net section. But if you take R equal to zero, that term disappears. Uh, so essentially what you have, uh, an expression similar to what we uh, showed when I explained away the uh, uh, polyethylene uh, length effects on fracture on strength of polyethylene samples, experimental data of MART that I showed before. So similar expression here, uh, and this is for fatigue crack growth. So now, uh, how does this uh, how does this compare with some more rigorous fracture mechanics result? Now, if you if you if you look at all over fracture mechanics, the size effect is not talked about much. But if you really, you know, dwell deeper into the subject, uh, there are some numerical work done by Bowie uh, in the 70s, I believe, uh, that looked at the effect of length of the specimen uh, on an stress intensity factor. And that's what's shown um, here in the table. Um, you, uh, Bowie tried to compute numerically uh, he, he kind of mathematically handles specimen um, volume above and below the crack uh, using some integral approach and determines the uh, kind of an asymptotic solution. Um, uh, by using asymptotic approach, he finds out the uh, K value of a crack. Uh, you know, just like uh, many other works, that numerically determine K by 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 measuring the strength of the singularity at the crack tip or the crack crack tip 
uh, crack wake uh, opening profile. Um, you know, singularity goes as inverse square root of distance uh, from the crack tip, but from the uh, uh, for the stress singularity, for the displacement, uh, it also called the square root of um, distance behind the crack tip. So you can use either of these uh, linear elastic conditions to force a solution and find out K, uh, conforming to those crack tip or crack wake condition. And that's how numerically uh, many of these methods calculate K value. Um, uh, there is no analytical approach to determine K value in uh, in in these uh, in this uh, fraction mechanics framework. So he tabulated values for various A by W um, in the table here and various H by W values. So H is the height or length of the sample, W is a width, and you can see, uh, and the, his data is plotted on the right um, for different H by W value, starting from uh, H by W one uh, to about four. So four curves, one, two, three, four is your H, uh, length to width ratio. Uh, that's the data. And the lines uh, we show is from the net section approach we computed. Uh, as you can see the equation above, the change in net section energy times E, square root of that, is the fraction mechanics equivalent here. So the change in net section strain energy works uh, similar to the Griffiths uh, strain energy that he computed uh, for a crack in an infinite medium, right? The delta U term we talked about before. So it has the same, uh, it has a similar principle behind that. So it's a similar quantity. So just like we convert uh, Griffiths energy to K, we just multiplied the change in net section strain energy by elastic modulus, take a square root. So that gives you the uh, a quantity that is analogous to uh, K that you can compare with the numerical solutions of Bowie here. So that is what is shown. And we, have is a, we were actually surprised to find a pretty good agreement from a s simple equation um, um, uh, with the numerical data. Uh, of Bowie, which is considered to be more exact. Uh, but again, uh, sometimes when when you look at the fraction mechanics handbooks, uh, the K solutions are accurate to 1% or 0.1%. I really don't know what's the basis of those claims. They are accurate, no doubt, but there is a reference um, to the accuracy. There should be an independent reference to accuracy. So there can be some errors, uh, but the statement of accuracies that you find in fraction mechanics formulas are kind of self-reference. And how exactly the mathematics was done was used as a basis to define accuracy of those solutions. So that uh, that's what I think is you need a different reference point of view to compare the accuracy of anything. Um, and here I compare, you know, the num Bowie's numerical data um, and our change in net section strain energy approach. And these will compare pretty good. Any differences could be due to some errors. Uh, the numerical approach can also have some error, um, but we are trying to determine how much of that is present there uh, and what is the approximation here. Uh, and, and we'll visit that a little bit later. So, uh, I come to this point because uh, remember the fatigue crack growth experiment. We are dealing with size effect uh, on fatigue crack growth of different uh, samples of different length. Uh, so we couldn't rationalize using the known fraction mechanics expressions, right? Because they don't have a, a way to implement the size effect and calculate correctly. So we looked at then how we can how can we compute. Uh, a quantity that I can use for uh, calculation, very easily used for calculation of delta K for specimens of different length. And this formula you see here is what we are going to use. Um, and, and there is also another formula done by my friend, uh, Reggie John at Red Person Air Force Base. You know, Sundar knows Reggie very well <laughs> for many years, I think. He's a, so, uh, Reggie and uh, Ringling uh, at the time, 98, were trying to develop expressions for specimens of different length for the same geometry, um, you know, uh, rotation free, um, modified single edge tension samples. Uh, and he, he, he has a numeric, he 
he calculates k uh, by numerical approach, by finite element approach, and then synthesizes the results into some polynomial function to determine um, by regression, uh, determine the finite width correction factor. And and if you write the formula for, for his result, it's long and complex, as you can see here. So essentially, k is a function of stress, square root of crack size, times f of a by w, and f of a by w is some function of a polynomial as shown in the second box on the left. And then in that box, you see the numerator has coefficients ai. You know, ai can go from one to six, and each each a, a1, a2, a3, uh, a4, shown in the left, have uh, some long functions of specimen size, okay? So there is a there is a work done numerically to capture the size effect on fraction mechanics, uh, but it wasn't much appreciated at the time. Um, but I remember Reggie was trying to test some metal matrix composites of different uh, sizes, so he needed this kind of work. Um, but I, I, I use this as a comparison um, here, okay? Now, so if you put aside the net section parameter and use uh, Reggie, Reggie's expression for BAD and delta K computation, the data agrees good for H by W greater than one, but H by W less than one do not agree. They're they're still shifted. Um, the the blue and the black data points, the blue diamonds and black squares are still far away from the consolidated data that you see for H by W greater than one. And if you use a net section parameter uh, that we developed here, you can uh, have a better agreement uh, as shown on the right, but still they're, they're a bit far off from each other. Uh, we had to rationalize that somehow. Now, one reason why the net section parameter uh, has an improved agreement compared to Reggie, John, and Wrigley's expression is because the validity of Reggie's expressions are limited to two, uh, H by W ratios from two to 10, whereas uh, the, from the principle that I illustrated, there's no constraint of calculating net section change in energy for any size. You just have to change the you just have to change the h value in the expression. Or if width is varying, you have to change the width in the expression. So there's no limitation on computing uh, change in net section energy, strain energy, or an equivalent as shown in the expression here for any size. So um, that's how we use it to calculate the delta C um, and compare the data, plot the data, uh, DAD and crack growth rate versus change in net section strain energy as computed by the net section parameter for various H by W, they all, they agree better, right? So it's still far off, that's a mystery. And, and that mystery I'm gonna explain next slide. And that is, uh, we've been pondering about this for a while and why, why we are not able to consolidate the data in despite the fact that we are kind of averaging everything here, right? So uh, one may doubt that the net section approach is sort of approximate or kind of a, you know, uh, you know, some grand scheme of averaging of energy in the net section as opposed to fraction mechanics, which captures accurately the correct behavior, right? So one could argue that, in fact, I hear that argument many times that you know we are doing average sense in the net section approach so how do you expect to how do you expect it to uh, explain away your result very well so uh, a valid point but i think uh, I, I think that there are other factors that leads to this little bit far off data here uh, which i'm going to talk about in a moment so we have to take a look at what is happening inside the grip by the way, can all of you hear me well still? Yes, it's fine, Ravi, go ahead. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, okay, so I think three or four more slides, then I will be coming to the end of my talk. Uh, so uh, this is an important point that I like to uh, explain uh, to give you an idea of what we are talking about and why there are discrepancy uh, in the agreement 
in, in trying to have the data agree with each other when interpreted in terms of change in net section strain energy. So if you think about um, the portions of the uh, specimen inside the grip, as the crack grows in the fatigue crack growth experiment, everything is changing, right? Including the part of the specimen inside the grip, the energy within that is changing uh, as the crack grows. Even though you're compressing by the grip, we're not, we not influencing by this gripping process. We are in no way altering the tension, uh, tensile stress fields or the corresponding strain energies that the specimen experiences for the portions inside the grip. So, um, so the gripping is in compression. That is, that is in the thickness direction, right? So, so when you when you pull the sample, the there is a shear stress uh, that transfers the load from the grip to the specimen to the gripped portion, uh, and and then it takes some length over which the shear stress transforms into a normal stress. So this this idea is for, comes from shear lag theory uh, that people use in composites or in uh, reinforced materials about how load transfers from a broken fiber in a composite to the matrix uh, from the end of a broken fiber inside the composite to far away into the matrix how the load is being transferred is basically um, uh, basically analyzed through the idea of shear lag i think um, was, was one of the earliest work than that was kelly and stewart in uh, cambridge um, we, we use a similar approach in the sense uh, we are trying to find out here um, uh, what is the effective length of the specimen that is actually uh, in effect during the experiment, right? So, all right, we have a specimen length defined as H outside the grip, but there's a bit of a uh, length, we call it H naught inside the grip, and that experiences um, the change in strain energy as the crack grows, but but that change that occurs within that is in terms of shear stress, right? Because a field of uh, load transfer within the grip section is basically shears in in the sense of shear as shown in the red line, um, and so when there's a change in strain energy that happens in the net section within the specimen, in the middle of the specimen, the corresponding changes are also occurring in the portion of the specimen inside the grip. So that means the specimen is actually in effect effectively longer than what really it is outside the grip. So we have to determine that to account for the true length of the specimen. So uh, that once we realize that, that concept, uh, the importance of this concept, the imp importance of the portion of the specimen inside the grip as being in some way part of the whole experience of change in net section strain energy, if you realize that, then we can e readily write an expression as shown here. Uh, so um, in the green box you see below the specimen here is on the left is the is the strain energy, elastic strain energy in the in the gray area. Um, uh that is that is kind of uh that is there due to the shear lag uh low transfer mechanism from the grip to the specimen and on the right is the is the strain energy as you would see within the middle of the sample right for a crack free specimen I mean, this is by the way it doesn't matter you had to first determine for a specimen without a crack so we i'm trying to relate the idea of the strain energy within the grip for the portion of the specimen within the grip uh, and the strain energy um, uh, far away from the grip. So uh, it should be the same. Uh, let me stand that a little bit corrected. The strain energy density, um, the elastic strain energy density as created by the shear field within the grip is what's on the left side of the equation. And on the right side is the tensile strain field, uh, tensile strain energy density, as you would interpret in a unit volume of a specimen far away from the grip. So both should be the same, right? The energy density should be the same. 
and we use that idea to determine was an effective extra length inside the grip behaving as being part of the specimen during the particular growth experiment right so and then you 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 we interpret that as hg meaning the extra length hg within the grip is related to um, two times the length of the sample that is gripped inside the grip uh, the, and the, the length of the edge that is gripped inside times one plus Poisson's ratio by four. So it's a simple analysis here just to find out an effective length, effective equivalent length for a tensile strain field, uh, tensile elastic strain energy. Sorry, this is a little mouthful here. <laughs> I, I hope you follow what I'm referring to, but I can explain a little bit better later. So if we implement this concept, then your actual specimen aspect ratios change from, um, you know, change from, uh, Sorry, uh, change from 0.42 for the lowest size to 1.1, and 0.7 h by w becomes 1.37. So the new length we we refer to it as h star by w. So h by w changes to h star by w, and these values change from 0 0.4, 0 0.42 to 1.1, 0 0.7 to 1.37, and uh, uh, 1 to 1 1.67, 1 1.5 changes to 2.17 uh, and um, and so on. Uh, three also changes like like, the, like as it is shown. I kind of I can't see it here now because it's kind of overlapping with something else. But I I hope you see it. Okay, um, I think 3.6 something like that. Anyway, so now we are going to use the true length, uh, the effective aspect ratio um, in this equation here. So uh, instead of H by W, we're going to use H star by W and compute the change in net section strain energy and, and calculate current growth rate, right? So that is what's shown on the right, okay? So when you actually use the um, uh, grip section uh, included in this, change in strain energy calculation by 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 correcting the effective length correcting for the effective length we see improved correlations uh, in not only in its section approach but this also works for the uh, uh, Reggie John Riggling's expression because um, using the true length effective length changes the h star by uh, h by value that is valid. Um, remember, uh, uh, John Riggling expression is valid for H by W two or above. So when the modified values um, change from, say, the lowest aspect ratio H by W is 0.42, and by effective e effective length um, uh, is becomes 1.1. So now the 1.1 is more close to two than 0.42. So that means the use of effective lens it will naturally provide a better agreement with the data when we use the same uh, expression from um, John Riggling, simply because the um, use of specimen portion inside the grip makes uh, John, Riggling, John and Riggling expression more applicable, more valid compared to, compared to the uh, original aspect ratios without the grip portion. Now, uh, the change in next section approach is, is appears to be even better because the correlation is slightly tighter than the one, the correlation shown on the right is slightly tighter than the ones on the left. So, so we are happy about that in the sense, okay, yes, we are able to compute quite accurately the size effect on fatigue crack growth by the change in net section strain energy approach and by including the uh, effective length of the specimen length, uh, including the portion inside the grip. And this has been published, I have not updated the reference here, it's been published in the International Journal of Fatigue and you can easily find it. Um, if any of you are interested, I can send it. Um, okay, so now you see why um, the net section approach, uh, fraction mechanics uh, data from Fraction mechanics equivalent of the net section approach, why it agrees with the numerical result well 
here as shown in by the comparing with the Bowie's data. And also experimentally it is shown during particular growth experiment uh, that the size effect can be rationalized easily, readily in a simpler way by the change in net section approach. Um, this is my last slide. And um, now, does it work for other geometries? Um, so we recently looked at, uh, so the formula is nearly the same. You see the change in net section strain energy calculation is, is pretty much the same as the singlet uh, cracked specimen, because basically you can you can cut the central crack tension specimen in the middle and you have two singlet cracked specimens, right? So as long as you account for the width, uh, you know, the, the width of the uh, central crack tension specimen is 2W, and once, once you cut it into half, of course, you have W on either side, right? So if you make the change uh, and, and the same expression, is applicable for central crack tension specimen. And we have the uh, calculations from this equation here shown as lines and the data is from a numerical data of ECDA. Now ECDA's work was done in 1960, uh, sorry, 1973, and has been used as a basis to calculate or uh, to determine FFA by W uh, in Tata Paris Urban Handbook. So in fact, if you look at the, uh, the first expression for central crack specimen was actually um, produced by Irwin himself from best regard stress function. That is the um, uh, tan, uh, TAN function. They used to call it TAN function for central crack specimen. And then Federson came and he looked at Ishida's results and he said all the data, by some magic, right, um, all the data can be fit by a secant function. Uh, so Indeed, I mean the uh, almost uh, the entire data set um, of ECDAS numerical k values for central crack tension specimen was simply fit by a secant function by proposed by Federson, uh, and that's what the second formula in your uh, Tata Paris Irwin handbook. And then of course Tata uh, improvised on that, added some more things to make it more accurate. So so ECDAS results is sort of a um, you know, kind of a sort of the center of the universe uh, as as the probably the most accurate uh, analysis performed on a crack in a central crack in a central crack configuration to find out k values. So we are now comparing with that data, his tabulated data that you see that has in his paper, and with the calculation here. And I would say the agreement is pretty good for the simpler approximations we are doing. And you can see the agreement for the uh, point 0.4. Remember, the approach we use here can cover any any H by W. Uh, you, you know, there's a limitation in fracture mechanics that often said is that you can you can use shorter specimens, meaning uh, your samples cannot be shorter than uh, shorter than the width of the sample, right? Giving you H by W values less than one. Uh, the fracture mechanics formula. By uh, by Irwin or by Federson or by Tada, they break down because they are all applicable for H um, by W two or more, I believe. Um, so there is that limitation there, but the numerical results were done for all H by W, which is not which has not been synthesized into any any good formula in fraction mechanics. In fact, the uh, Isidore's work uh, was was not fully utilized uh, to implement it in fresh mechanics. So, but we are here using it for comparison with the net section approach uh, in the interest of uh, finding a simpler uh, yet accurate enough approach to calculate driving force for crack growth in fracture or fatigue for samples of different sizes. So that's our broader philosophy, our broader pursuit here. Can we use the strength of materials approach by Timoshenko, right? So this is, People, people would call this like a kind of a Timoshenko approach. Uh, uh, so our motivation is to find a simple way uh, to develop expressions for um, calculating crack driving forces for specimens of various sizes. Here, mainly talking about length. Similar principles work for width and thickness. Um, and we haven't explored that yet, but experimentally one, one can, I believe one can confirm uh, the very effect of width or thickness Again, this is again beyond beyond the plane strain, plane stress idea 
that is uh, common in fraction mechanics. Anyway, um, just to conclude, um, uh, so there is this broadly you see, we see broadly that there is a size effect, uh, whether you talk in terms of fracture or fatigue, uh, and in terms of fracture, you see um, size effect in various forms of fracture testing, including um, notched bending, slow bending tests, notched impact tests, uh, whether it is a metal, glass, or a plastic, um, and and uh, and more importantly, that uh, the, so uh, you see the only experimental, um, only good experimental support here is the March polymer film experiment showing the photoelastic unloading of the material regions above and below the crack. And that is the only, uh, I believe, uh, that is the only uh, experimental support for all that, but we are doing it here. I mean, you could theoretically say there's nothing wrong with our approach, right? A simple strength of materials approach, right? It doesn't violate any fractional mechanics principle. But, uh, but, but the argument would be then it's not accurate enough. <laughs> right. So anyway, we're trying to deflect that criticism, but I believe a simpler way of doing it is accurate. Um, as long as as long as we consider calculating strain energy per unit volume is accurate or not, right? Uh, you know, uh, from a strength and metals approach, you calculate strain energy in bending in a crack-free sample using using the formulae given by Timoshenko, right? Uh, or by uh, are by you know one by two sigma squared by e the strain energy density of a specimen. That's approximate, right? Because you take a force by area modulus. They are not any accurate than strength of materials approach. Okay, so uh, so I think we are coming from coming from our work, especially the experiments on the modified single edge tension samples, uh, particular particular growth testing of specimens of different length and constant width, we are able to rationalize the size effect by looking at the uh, the change in net section strain energy and including the uh, uh, effective length uh, or length of the sample uh, at the inside the grip. Uh, so we find the simple net section approach incorporating the size effect here is as accurate as the numerical uh, data provided by Bobby and Ishida, and also um, with the finite element results synthesized as K expressions by John and Rigling. So I, I believe the size effect can be easily handled using net section approach. Uh, what we have shown here is for simple testing, and we're working for uh, uh, working for uh, a similar uh, similar calculations for bending, three-point bending CT sample. And we have published some papers to show that can be also done. And there are some size effects inherent, much like the size effect here, um, because you just have to think in terms of specimens like CT sample is a combination of tension and bending, right? You know, uh, and so on. So, uh, and there is a, uh, we worked out some of those formula and then I'll share it in a future uh, future occasion. Um, with that, you know, uh, that concludes my talk. I really appreciate uh, uh, appreciate um, Raghu for inviting me, and and also the other member, key members of INSYS, which is Vikram uh, and Sundar, both of whom I know very well, and it's a pleasure to present this at their presence because they have done some remarkable work. Both Vikram, um, I do remember. Uh, <laughs> just a little bit history, uh, Vikram. <laughs> I do remember the day uh, Vikram came for an interview from Stanford in IAC. Actually, oh. I, don't know, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. Vikram remembers, but we actually went and picked him, picked him up from Bangalore Rail Station. <laughs> I remember. I remember. <laughs> so, uh, and of course, Sundar, I know very well for many years. It's been. Uh, uh, one of my motivating forces in Bangalore when I was there. So with that, thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, I've actually unmuted uh, everybody. So if there are questions, I, I see two in the chat box. But you're well, if Mahindra is there, he's welcome to unmute himself and ask the question. This is a question regarding compliance. 
Sure. Okay, I'll read. I, okay, uh, I'll read the question out. Uh, it yeah. says, are you using the compliance method to calculate K1? Uh, it goes on to say, Marshan et al. have developed analytical solutions for fixed displacement conditions sometime in the 1980s. Okay, that's the question. Yeah, well, um, you know, the, uh, the, um, the compliance method that that is referred to is a way of experimentally determining you know, geometry correction factors. Um, you know, you can you can actually the there is a Irwin's expression that relates to the uh, um, energy release rate to the change in compliance of the sample, uh, and so people have done experimentally measured. Uh, of course, take the specimen, grow the crack at different crack lens and measure the load displacement functions. And then there is a Irwin's relationship. You can calculate the finite width correction factor from that. Uh, but much of the um, uh, uh, finite width correction factors that has been compiled in Tara Paris Irwin handbook, the fraction mechanics handbook, right? Uh, you all familiar with. Those are all mathematical solutions, most of them. Uh, and if you look at Isida, Bentham and Quiter, um, Federson, uh, Jim Newman. Um, so there was a lot of famous people. Uh, Paul Paris, of course, um, Jim Rice, uh, J Integral, right? So, uh, are, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who worked on fraction mechanics in the 70s, were mainly devoting their energies to mathematically determine the 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 uh, the uh, finite width correction factors for various fraction mechanics geometries because it enables them to characterize fracture do, using different testing approaches, different specimen geometry. Mm -hmm. uh, so compliance method that is that you're referring to probably you're referring to experimental measurement, and uh, they are not many. Uh, they are not uh, many. But but if you if you look at um, uh, what is the meaning of compliance in the net section approach. Uh, I guess that may be the center of your question is, yes, I'm using the change in compliance of this specimen due to the crack, right? Uh, that's what, so basically you see the uh, expression on the left, delta C is equal to half times P, uh, deflection, um, uh, deflection after the crack, which is the delta max one minus deflection before the crack. So that is your change in compliance, right? The change in compliance is, of course, is inherent in calculating strain energy because you're change, you're basically changing the stiffness, right, of the net section. So you use that principle, and then you go from that to stress and strain, as shown in the figure on the right. So so loads and displacements can correspond to the stresses. And displacements in the net section. So when you when you introduce a crack, you go from a stress of sigma in the net section uh, before the crack uh, to sigma l, l being for ligament, right? So so that increase in stress in the net section is due to compliance only, right? I hope this answers it. Yeah. There's another question. Jaya, do you want to ask your question? You can unmute yourself and ask. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, please go ahead. Hello. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, many thanks, Professor Ravichandra. It was very insightful for me to learn about uh, these things. And we have been working on some of these as well. Uh, so I was wondering if the uh, grip length that you talked about in the shear lag, uh, where you consider H naught, is that a constant or is that also scaling with the sample length H, the capital H? Uh, uh, it's simply a function of how much you grip inside the, how much, po what is the portion of a sample you grip inside the in a grip? Yes, I understand that. But uh, the H naught that you take is, is something that, um, dictates your H star, right? If you can, H G, sorry, H G, yeah. So, so this H naught, is it a fixed quantity in, in the experiments or is it something that scales with the sample height as well? 
Yeah, no, no. You see in the figure, uh, H naught is indicated. So it is from the uh, edge of the grip. It is simply the length of the specimen inside the grip. I, I guess the question is, uh, when you scale the sample up, are you also scaling the gripping portion up, or do you keep that a constant? Yes. Oh, uh, oh, okay. I understand now. I think in the experiments, it was maintained constant. Um, uh, yes. So, uh, yes, in the experiment, it was maintained constant. Uh, that means for all the samples we tested, uh, the 2 h uh, is 101. So, h naught is about 50 millimeter uh, for all the samples. So, that was maintained constant. Even though specimen lengths were changing, okay? Okay. okay. Because okay. you don't, you don't yeah. need. Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean that was. Uh, I, I mean, uh, luckily it was maintained constant. <laughs> you didn't realize. Yeah. The, yeah it, one doesn't realize the importance of it unless you do the, until un, unless and until you do the experiment and realize the significance of that quantity. But luckily, Sarah, who did the experiments, uh, kept that constant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was I was curious because you seem to see this effect predominantly at h by w less than one, right? So because you keep your h not constant, so it becomes important only at small uh, h by w's and not at large h by w's. Is that a correct conclusion to make? Uh, it, it's important at all sizes. It's just that we don't see the. We, it's not as dramatic uh, for two reasons. If you see, um, oh yes, in a way you are correct. I think what you are pointing out too is the fact that as you as you decrease your specimen length, right, the grip size, the portions inside the grips are becoming comparable to the specimen length outside the grip, yes. right? Yes. That, that's why the significance in, increases. Uh, but if you have a if you have an infinitely long specimen, then the portion within the grip, if maintained constant, will be insignificant. Yes, right, correct. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was actually curious because, like I said, we we do such experiments. We were doing it on wires rather than uh, rectangular samples. So this is cylindrical geometries. Uh, but I, I was curious if I did the opposite of uh, actually fixing my overall sample dimension and varying the ratio of the extent that is gripped versus the extent which is free, uh, then my results uh, may be different or it probably would be the same. Um, I, I, I think if you're, let's say you are testing um, uh, very long specimens like wires, right, uh, of a, a meter or two meter or three meter, uh, with those lengths, and if you're gripping, say about an inch on either side, you may not see a effect of that grip portion. Um, but if you're having a short wire, right, a very short wire, say one inch long wire, and you're gripping either side, one inch left and one one inch and right, then you will see a substantial effect of grip size, um, as understandable now, right? Because yeah. because you're, you're your calculation, uh, the changes in strain energy that happens. Um, um, yes, yeah, so here, here is the expression for H. Um, and you take a square root of that when you for comparison with K, right? You see the H is under square root. So um, uh, it, it has a bigger effect at smaller. Uh, the grip, grip portions will have accordingly. So it, it's like two things. One, one is one fact is under the square root, right? And how yeah. square root of a number is different at small sizes and long sizes. That's one factor. Second, in second, the extra length inside the grip, you know, it's obviously dominant at small h values than at large h values. So both will will affect, but. I would point out to the uh, ECDAS uh, result, right? Um, so if you look the curve in the bottom, 